I thought I would uh, continue to share a little bit about equanimity uh, more specifically. And then uh, in about 20 minutes or so of exploring equanimity, we could, um, we could have some conversation for the last uh, part of the, the time together. Does that sound all right? We get too, too many talks. Um, so when I was a child, uh, I had this toy, maybe some of you know it, called the Weeble. It was shaped like an egg. And uh, it was made of plastic and it had a, oops, you can hear me, right? Okay, so this toy was shaped like an egg and it had this weight at the bottom of it. And um, yes, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down was the, uh, was the commercial. So there was this weight that kept it balanced and centered. So you could tip it and it would rock, but it would always come back up to center. And we have something in us that can help us do that as well. When life knocks us off center and we tip over, equanimity is a, a powerful, powerful practice that can help us come back upright when we're knocked over. So equanimity um, is a translation of uh, the Sanskrit word upeksha and the Pali word upekka. Upa, the first part of that word is over or all around and ksha the second part of the word means to look so it means to be able to see from all around like standing on a high mountain to see all sides and from this standpoint we don't take sides because we see the situation in its entirety so equanimity can also mean to see with patience to see with understanding and spaciousness. So it's in different places translated as non-discrimination, impartiality, tolerance, letting go, and non-attachment, which is different from indifference. And my teacher Thai also translates upeksha as inclusiveness, which to me gives it a, a more engaged, involved and active nuance than all the non, non words, <laughs> non discrimination, uh, non attachment. This is like being inclusive. It's doing something rather than not doing something. So inclusiveness or equanimity, it's not dogmatic. It's not something that imprisons us, right? It allows us to keep an open mind. So when we're climbing a ladder, we have to leave one rung to get to the next rung. And so we have to let go of what we know now in order to be open to learning something new. So the willingness to see things with fresh eyes that's an important part of equanimity, of inclusiveness. It's not thinking that we know everything already. So the Dalai Lama has said, if, if science proves any Buddhist teaching wrong, I'll give it up. I won't cling to it. That's uh, equanimity, that's inclusiveness. So as, as foundational as Buddhist practices and teachings have been for him and for his culture, he won't, he won't cling to them. 
as that keeps us from moving forward, from growing, from seeing things as they are. So this is a question that that Thay would often ask us to ask ourselves, which is, are you sure to regularly check if our perceptions are really corresponding with reality? Because as the Buddha said, most of our perceptions are wrong. We think the sun is rising, but it rose seven minutes ago, right? We, we connect with north and south and east and west, but it's a very relative way of seeing our location, right? For, for in, in one part of the world, what is south, on the other part of the world is north. So we have to check our perceptions. We're usually looking just from one side of the mountain, not seeing from the top. So we're unable to see the whole situation clearly. So when we find ourselves in times of transition or difficulty, we might cling to the ladder, the rung of the ladder that we're on because it's safe, it's what we know. But what might it be like to relax our grip so we can move to the next rung? So inclusiveness, equanimity helps us trust that we're going to be okay, even if right now it's very uncomfortable or even hardly bearable. The more we can relax and let go, the easier it will be. So some years ago, my mom and I visited a museum. It had an interactive exhibit on the brain. And so we played a game at this exhibit where we sat across from each other and we had to compete to get our ball to go the furthest distance. To do this, we had to relax. So we were wearing sensors with a headband that measured our level of relaxation. And the more we relaxed, the more our ball went where we wanted it to go more quickly. So it was very counterintuitive that to progress, you had to let go and relax. We laughed a lot playing that game. But that's very much how life is. The more we can relax, settle back, move with how things are, the more we actually can advance in the direction that we want to go in. Tensing up, pushing, uh, doesn't actually uh, usually get us there. So in order to relax, we need to let go and stop clinging, like we practice in this meditation. When good things come, how do we enjoy them but then let them go? So in the game, the ball doesn't advance because we're trying hard. It advances because we let go. And Ajahn Cha, the Thai forest monk, he said, if you let go a little, you'll have a little freedom. If you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of freedom. And if you let go completely, you'll have complete freedom. So equanimity, inclusiveness, this Uh, Oh, so who won? I won. (laughs) My mom was close, close behind me. So this uh, equanimity, this inclusiveness, this ability to relax and let go, we could see it as a kind of grandparent's love, which is more peaceful than the love of a parent. 
because it's not as attached. The love is there, but without as much suffering. So equanimity helps us take a longer, bigger view that uh, there's more to this than meets the eye than to just this one moment in time. So we're not as caught up in what's uh, right here. And we, we allow people to have their, their lives and go on their journeys and that, that life is made up of 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows, as the Taoist teachings share with us. That we can't protect people from the, the sorrows. No, that we, they have to go through what they have to go through. So all the beauty, the happiness, the wonder, the connection, the belonging, and all the separation, the anxiety, the depression, the despair, that's part of a human life. So it doesn't mean we don't try to alleviate suffering when it can be alleviated, but we can touch great freedom when we accept that this is part of the path, this is part of life and not a mistake. So with equanimity, with inclusiveness, we can know how not to make things worse when pain comes. We can choose not to add to the pain by resisting, suppressing, and judging it. Instead, we can choose to open to it, to allow for the fact that a certain measure of pain is part of life. So this is a really important quality um, right now as our world begins to heat up and get more and more polarized and uncertain and um, structures are less and less reliable. Um, the things we are used to having are crumbling. So in a situation like this, equanimity can really help us to keep resourced and to stay connected to our center. So we need to be able to relate to all of this divisiveness, all of this mm, confusion and pain around us with compassion, but also with clarity, with discernment. We need to address injustice, but also not dehumanize people that are causing great pain and suffering. How do we see from all sides when things are very polarized and tense, when there's a lot of blaming, when there's a lot of violence. How do we include people in our hearts, really practicing inclusiveness when they're, when they're acting without integrity, when they're jeopardizing the foundations of our democracy or ripping apart our social fabric. So equanimity can help us to not discriminate and to let go of the tendency to see ourselves as separate from others. So when uh, January 6th happened, 2021, I was talking with my dad about it. My dad has had quite a, a long journey with social justice work. He's a Christian minister who worked with Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference on desegregating the South. Then he spent 30 years working in human and village development projects around the world, spending several years in India, Philippines, Kenya, and he also became a student of Thich Nhat Hanh when I was uh, 
joining that community. He was ordained as a Buddhist Dharma teacher in 2008. And he started a Sangha over 25 years ago, a meditation group that keeps meeting every week. So when we were reflecting on this event uh, and the need to keep our balance when this uh, very destabilizing thing happened, he said, when we see ourselves as victims, that is the separate self. But when we see ourselves as beloved, that is no self. So if we see ourselves as victims, that's seeing, that's identifying with these eight worldly winds, right? And seeing ourselves as beloved is coming into the center of the wheel to realize that we don't have a separate self, that we are everyone involved in that situation on all sides of the political uh, realms. So when we see ourselves as beloved, full of loving kindness, we see ourselves in everyone and everyone in ourselves. And we have a force with which to meet the ignorance, discrimination, and even violence in others so that it doesn't cripple us by making us hateful. And when we see ourselves as beloved, we are in opposition to no one. So during the war in Vietnam, Thai said, other people are not our enemy. A human can never be our enemy. Our only enemies are delusion, hatred, and ignorance. It's possible to uproot those in ourselves and in others. If we go around eliminating people, we're not going to get to the root of the issue. Because that's not where the issue comes from. It comes from the minds, the hearts that can be transformed. So if we see ourselves as beloved, not as victims, we can encounter others without malice. Even when we disagree, even when there's a very intense conflict. And that is the power of equanimity, of, of inclusiveness. So this practice is something each of us has access to. Not shutting someone out because they're different. Not writing someone off because of something they've done. Continuing to see from the top of the mountain that they have their ups and downs. There's a story that I really am always inspired by of Jim Lawson. He was a, a key person in the civil rights movement who taught people nonviolence. He had studied it in India, he had trained um, in Gandhian nonviolence, and he he was leading, helping to lead one of the marches during the sit-ins in Nashville. And these young white motorcyclists, kind of young toughs, were beating up one of the marchers at the back of the line. And so Jim Lawson was described as getting out of his place in line and walking to the back as if he had a long scheduled appointment, like very matter of factly, very calmly. And when he came to the back of the line where these two men were beating up one of the marchers, he just said calmly, can I help you? And one of the men spat in his face and he 
calmly asks the man, do you have a handkerchief? And the man, rather stupefied, took out his handkerchief and gave it to Jim Lawson so he could wipe the spittle off of his face. And then Jim Lawson started asking them about their motorbikes and saying, what, uh, you know, horsepower or you know, what kind of motor is this motorcycle? And the young men started to talk to him about the motorcycle. Meanwhile, the young black man they were beating up was able to get up and rejoin the march. And he talked to them about their motorcycles, their leather jackets. And they didn't end up becoming friends, but they completely shifted their demeanor. They were responding to him as another human being who was interested in their motorcycles and who knew something about motorcycles enough to get them to talk about theirs. So exactly, he recognized their humanity. He was able to see you're doing this, but this isn't all of who you are. And I can touch off something in you that's more than this harmful and ignorant and discriminatory action. And you'll respond to that because we're, we're organic beings as human beings. And there's seeds deep down in our store consciousness that are responsive to being watered. So even if you're in the midst of a violent act, your seed of compassion, of friendliness, of human connection can be watered if someone is skillful enough to water it, to break you out of the trance of separation that you're in, causing violence. So what kind of equanimity that Jim Lawson had to have to approach those young men, right? And this practice of equanimity, of inclusiveness, it can give us a lot of courage. And the Buddha said, when you have equanimity, you have a mind of immeasurable peace. When you have peace, you have a lot of freedom. And when you have freedom, you're not so afraid of what the world is bringing to you. So you can make those courageous choices to act with a lot of spaciousness. So I'm gonna stop here and really appreciate you uh, listening and, and reflecting with me. And so um, let's take a breath together with the sound of the bell. And, um, and then we'll open the space for your reflections, your questions. So um, I see uh, Wendy has your hand raised and then uh, Bob and Doris. Kara, uh, do you want to ask them to unmute? Um, yes, yes, yes. So thank, thank you so much. Um, your voice and everything you said I really needed to hear today. I, I just appreciate you so much. So here, here's my question. If you have somebody that you love very much in your family, 
that is behaving um, in very hurtful ways. I think it's because, because they are holding a lot of poison and anger inside them. And they're behaving in ways uh, to all family members that are very hurtful. How do you have boundaries yet stay present? And, and I don't know how to manage that. Thank you for the question, Wendy. Um, so, it's possible to love even as you're saying no. It's possible to care for yourself by not putting yourself in a difficult or damaging situation with someone who is offering poison, as you put it, and still be taking care of them because you are taking care of yourself and you're not disconnected from them. The intention of you taking care of yourself is to be able to be present for them. Because if you don't take care of yourself, then what is left to be present for them? So, so boundaries are uh, very much an expression of um, love if they allow you to preserve yourself so that you can be looking deeply to see how you can support this person how you can direct good things their way you can't do that if you're exposing yourself to their uh, toxicity and becoming incapacitated by it but your purpose in setting up the boundary is not out of hate, is not out of um, judgment. It's because you want to help. And it's even a teaching in Buddhism that preventing someone from doing harm is, uh, is a very compassionate thing to do. So not letting them speak to you in a terrible way keeps them from committing a harmful action that will come around to bite them mm. in the future. So actually not letting them keep doing harmful things is, uh, is very skillful. But you're not doing it because you don't care about them, because you want them out of your life, there's there's a way to have them be a part of your life but not harming you not you know and and that's you know maybe a conversation with the family too if 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 it's a family-wide thing is how how can everyone be really looking to see what would really help this person it may not be that the family can offer that it may, it may need to come from somewhere else and it may not be on any kind of timeline that we can um, have control over when they're going to be open to some helpful intervention but at least the family can be talking about um, what and be unified also mm. in being consistent in having a boundary that doesn't allow that person to keep hurting other people in the family, but that will still give them hopefully access to things that could help them. Thank, thank you very much. I, I think what I'm going to do is, is send the video that I just watched of you to my family members. I, that was just what I needed to hear. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you. Wendy. 
Wishing you well with that. Yeah. And uh, Bob and Doris, do you want to unmute? Hi. So uh, we kind of had this a similar situation where uh, we have a grandson that was born in October, and my son's wife is full of poison, and um, it's from her childhood and stuff. I I've been able to figure all that out, but um, I'll never be right, and I'll, they'll never be happy. And I I before we sat down today for the meditation, I had a stomach ache, and I I've just felt sick since they. I asked for a picture last week and they lashed out at me of all the horrible things, you know, I say and do things and I live 4,000 miles away from them. <laughs> it's like, but um, it really affected me physically and it's been just really hard, but this has helped me so much. And we were actually able to have a day off today at the beach. So we just came from the ocean and you're, um, you know, when you were talking about the water and the wave and the feel, I just want you to know how much the help. And I believe also that I have to put up some boundaries that um, I was maybe trying to cling for a relationship and I have to just maybe have boundaries and um, yeah, and loosen the grip on the rung. <laughs> so, yeah. So you answered my question actually when you answered her. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us, uh, Bob and Doris. And, um, you know, one other other piece is um, um, that grandchild has you in its every cell. Is it a, a boy or a girl? Oh, you're you're muted. Sorry. It's, it's a little boy and his name is Everett. Oh, and I, okay. I only saw him uh, with, when the baby was born, my son called me and um, that was it. And then I got a Christmas mm -hmm. card picture and have never mm -hmm. gotten anything else. So. Mm -hmm. well, well, just to say that, um, you know, um, you can, you can connect with your grandson in your meditation, mm. when you go to the beach, mm. when you do anything joyful or that you enjoy, you can share that moment with him and, and uh, offer, you know, he's carrying you in him and mm. you can be communicating with him um, in your heart. Um, and, and so, you know, that separation is real and it's painful and, um, and there are, um, there are ways to communicate and to stay connected, um, because he's, he's deeply, deeply connected to you both. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sending, sending Everett and grandparents a uh, very beautiful embrace. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, YP, would you like to unmute? Hi, Kara. Hi. I'm trying to get um, more acquainted with equanimity. Um, I've been learning about the other heavenly abodes and have gotten some familiarity with Metta, Karuna, and Mudita. And equanimity uh, puzzles me a little bit still. Um, perhaps maybe I can offer an example of what I think it might be and this I could get some insights. Um, so I think equanimity is when uh, I feel a lot of fear um, and I just notice it. Um, that's 
what it appears to me to be. Um, I think I've gone through a period where I was very stressed and it's led to me um, feeling easily startled. I feel sudden jabs of fear uh, a lot, especially when I'm stressed. Uh, and I'm aware that's not entirely normal, but I've been able to, uh, on certain occasions, just notice, ah, notice, there it is. Um, so to me, I think that's my experience of equanimity. It's, is that, yeah. does that make sense? Yes, it does, it does. And that's a beautiful practice of uh, being there for yourself when you have that difficult feeling. So you, you are, um, if you didn't recognize the fear, then you would just be on the side of the mountain. But because you are able to recognize, oh, that's my fear. That's the perspective of being up on top of the mountain, able to look around and not only identified with your fear. So that's exactly right, that that is equanimity, that you're able to see this arising. An interesting thing would be also to notice its qualities when it's arising, what things tend to trigger it. And also, can you notice when it fades away? Is there something else that takes its place or does it just fade and it's no longer there? Like just no noticing with curiosity, with interest, how it's present, how it's there, how it's fading, what, what causes it to come to be. And, uh, and that way you are investigating it, you're being with it, you're, you're befriending it. And that is really the, um, the action of equanimity to, um, to hold things like this rather than like, like that. <laughs> pushing away or pulling in, this is equanimity. You know? So that's exactly what, what you're describing. It's wonderful, wonderful. And, uh, and it's, it's, I think the fear you talk about is something that is uh, becoming very much common in many, many people in many places. So also holding that with equanimity that you're not abnormal. You're, you're a human being responding to a world that's a lot more out of control. So giving yourself that compassion. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, Art, do we have time for one more? Oh, sure. Um, okay. Rick routinely goes over okay. <laughs> time, so <laughs> it's at your discretion. And uh, Okay, I'm happy got, to, uh, to yes. take a, a one from Tom. You want to unmute? Thank you. And thank you for uh, coming tonight. I, I think what I'd like to hear more of is um, extending these examples that Wendy and I think Doris brought forth uh, regarding family situations and um, I have a situation where there's uh, acrimony from an adult child who is um, in a way perpetuating that and has no apparent willingness to seek a healing on any dimension. Um, how far do I go to promote that or do I, what I'm hearing is basically, I leave it alone and I love him. But that, okay. I love that doesn't quite satisfy me, so to speak. Sure. 
Sure. So um, I'd just like you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Excuse me, I've got background noise here. I'll, okay, okay, no problem. Uh, just mm -hmm. a minute. Okay, we're better. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, what's the alternative if you decide you're not going to accept this? What What are you left with if you're adult child doesn't want to do work towards healing what what are your options um my options uh, i suppose are to hold him in prayer um is to uh, somehow express that I remain available. Yes. You know, his closing me off doesn't dictate my closing him off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess I'm answering my own question here, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is to is to be available and. Um, not put gasoline on the fire that's burning yeah. in him. Yeah, yeah. Very, very important. I, I think that's really important. And, um, you know, um, just maybe reflecting in yourself, writing down the good memories you have of him when he was younger, um, the, the times you really enjoyed being with him. And um, mm -hmm. if, uh, if ever there's an occasion where he, he would be open to that, then watering those wholesome seeds in his consciousness by sharing, you know, beautiful memories with him and and um, his goodness, reminding him of his goodness that you you have to keep alive in yourself, even as you're seeing him mm -hmm. in this um, in this uh, not so healthy uh, expression. But the the part that existed before that is still there in him, mm -hmm. and so you have to keep that alive in you, so you can keep watering that in him. It may not be right now that he's open to it, but if you keep reminding yourself and and focusing your attention also on his strengths, his mm -hmm. capacities, then when the time is right, you can, um, as you say, you you stay open to him, and you're doing this work. And when it's when he's open, you can you can share many beautiful things that you appreciate about him to help also, uh, you know, this, this, uh, take apart the bomb that's there. Mm -hmm. So hearing about one's good qualities, about what people appreciate in someone is a very, um, does, does a world of good. It's not where we yeah. tend to start, but but it's a very powerful practice. Right. And it's not something. I mean, appreciate my appreciation on my part is not something he can deny. I mean, exactly. it's my appreciation of him. Exactly. And. Um, yeah. Okay. Offered freely, been... offered freely. You know, right. without expectation. And in, right. in the right time, you know, maybe not now, but maybe. But if you if you're watering that in yourself, when it when the opening is there, you can inject it into him. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes. Sending lots of care. Yeah. Yeah. Well, dear friends, I'm so grateful to have been able to spend this time with you. Um, I, I do have a, a website, uh, kyrajewel.com. You're welcome to sign up for my newsletter there. I send out a monthly newsletter and I do lots of teachings in different places on, in person and online. So feel free to join me. And um, what, a, what a wonderful Sangha this is here. <clears throat>